Amen. Well, let's not go to hell. Amen. Uh, you see there on the screen, Job 26, Proverbs 15, 2 Thessalonians. So kind of uh, have your, take a look there on the screen. This is not a joke either. Okay? This, there's one of these shock churches that promote themselves out to a lost and dying world in such a way as it just, I mean, it just reeks of hell itself. And this is how they promoted their church a couple years ago called The Naked Church. Yeah, this book, The Naked Church, it says, Are you confused, burned out, disillusioned with your church experience? Discover how intimacy with living God and His family can fulfill your deepest hungers. That's a setup. It's a setup, okay? It is trying to shock people. Uh... Get, get them lusting. That's what it's designed to do. There's a bunch of words through in my mind, and I'm thinking, I don't want to say that, I don't want to say that, I don't want to say that. But that's what it's designed to do. And <clears throat> when I was going over my notes, that just hit me. The difference between heaven and hell. Okay, we'll look at it tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll get into His Word tonight. Appreciate you all being here. Appreciate everybody online, and, and uh, it's good to visit. Uh, we had our visitors today. Uh, Brother Jeff, he's uh, taking care of some business in this area related to his mother's passing, and uh, he just, we had a good time, good talk in my office, and uh, he just really enjoys uh, watching our church online, and of course, good to have Brandon back with us, and he's visiting with us, and you're going to pray for him, and he feels like God's uh, calling him in a certain way, and I'm not going to say what it is, don't have permission, but just uh, pray at, for him and lift him up, all right? And I uh, had a conversation with a young man that follows our ministry from, I think it's from Arizona, Vasily. And um, we had a good conversation. So just, I just like how God is working through people. It's good to hear it. And uh, he really got a blessing. He was watching the sermon from last Sunday, last Sunday morning when Ian got up and testified. And he said, man, he said, that spoke to me. He said it was, just, it was just dead on, so I appreciate that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's thank God for not going to hell. Amen? Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for a good time in worship. Lord, I love these old songs. I thank you, Lord, for inspiring them, Lord, and giving them to us. Lord, we thank you, God, for good spiritual hymns and, and psalms to sing. Lord, I love to sing them with your people. I love to sing them in private. And I thank you, Lord, Father, for giving us music and helping us, dear God, to uh, see our way through sometimes, Lord. It lifts us up out of, a, out of a dark pit, Lord, just singing your praises. And, Lord, we're thankful for that. We thank you, dear God, for your word, Lord, that helps us explain things that are going on in this world. Lord, it is our guide to everything. And, Lord, you've taught me many years ago, Lord, there's not anything going on in this world that's not covered by Scripture. Father, just give us insight, give us understanding, give us help from heaven tonight, and help us, dear God, as a church to present forth to a lost and dying world the truth about hell. And Father, the truth that your son died paid our penalty so that none of us have to endure one second in hell. Christ covered it all we thank you lord and father use the messages the teaching father that we're giving on hell to reach people to maybe change how some cult or some liberal church has explained the bible away and help them to understand lord that your consequences for our transgressions are real and they're eternal Thank you, dear God, for providing then the eternal way of everlasting life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his suffering, his death, his resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of heaven that you give to us. Lord, open our eyes to your scriptures, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this is our series on hell. And we're looking at how the Bible describes hell. The, the plain doctrines, the teachings that are just, I mean, there's, there's no question 
that what the Bible said about hell is real. What man makes of it, uh, I'm reminded of, well, I showed this, I think, last Sunday. Did Pope Francis claim that hell doesn't exist? Yeah. That's what he believes. And then there are other churches whose doctrine, will a loving God punish people forever in hell? The answer to that is very simple. If you read the Bible, it says yes. God will punish those uh, with an everlasting punishment. It is not annihilation. And we're going to focus on the word destruction. And that, of course, leads some people to believe that we'll be destroyed or people will be destroyed and that'll be the end of it. And then, then there's no idea or no consciousness after your destruction. Well, the Bible's got a way of describing how it means destruction. I have that up on the screen. We'll get to that. But this is what really jumped out at me in uh, the notes. This section I call the similitudes of hell. The word similitude has the word similar in it. And so God is using language in the Bible and stories in the Bible and depictions in the Bible that are similar to what hell is and what the lake of fire is. Um, in fact, I'll just kind of ask you, if you were to think of a story in the Bible that you think portrays God's vengeance of hell fire upon wicked people, what story would you... Sodom and Gomorrah. The, and the Bible actually says that God instituted that wrath upon Sodom and Gomorrah as an example to the whole rest of the world, this is how God deals with sin. This is how God deals with it. And so if we believe that Sodom and Gomorrah, if we believe those stories are true, then we must believe that God means exactly what he says in the Bible. So here are the, how the Bible describes hell. Number one, tonight the Bible describes hell as naked. And destruction, having no covering. Job 26, 6, hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. So right here, the Bible is putting two words together for you. Hell and destruction. Hell is not just the grave where people can be embalmed and go in there and, and just lay there for eternity. Hell is a type of destruction, but according to the scripture, it is an everlasting destruction. That's in 2 Thessalonians. We'll get to that. Proverbs 15, 11 is a second witness to that. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more then the hearts of the children of men? But this idea that hell is naked before God, destruction hath no covering. What that made me do is it made me think of how hell then is the opposite of heaven. In heaven, and we'll get to that in a minute, in heaven, God covers us. He covers us with robes of righteousness so that we stand righteous before God. God covers up and clothes our, our nakedness, which is our desire. It is against nature to run around and be naked. It is against our nature. And you've probably heard me, I've talked this several times, and to me this makes a lot of sense. Sometimes we ask, well, how old is a child before they are going to be guilty before God? We call it the age of accountability. What age is that? Well, I don't think it's actually set in stone that when they reach like five or six or seven, then automatically they're going to hell. But I equate it to the idea of when a child, I'm thinking, I'm looking at Levi. He's sitting there so cute. And if Levi, how old is he right now? Two, two months, two years, two months. <laughs> it's awfully big for two months. Yeah, big boy. But anyway, if Levi, if Jared took all his clothes off right now here in church, he would just be as happy as he is sitting there right now. Jared might be a little concerned with him sitting on his lap for any length of time. But right now, he has no concern at all about whether he's clothed or not clothed. He can run around, naked. You ought to see Isaac back there giggling. Yeah. Who, Isaac? Well, Isaac doesn't do that anymore, does he? No. But he used to. Isaac used to run around, didn't he? Didn't he, Madeline? Buck naked. 
thought nothing of it. But at a certain point, something changes. Mom and daddy don't have to teach it to them. Something changes. And they start not wanting to be, they become aware of their nakedness. They become aware, just like Adam and Eve did, they become aware that they are not clothed. And it is their desire to be covered up. That's our nature. And I think that at about that time, that child then is starting to understand the difference between sin and righteousness. And even before that time, you can train a child, even at two years old, before he has the knowledge of sin, you train them that certain things are wrong. You train them. You don't just beat them, you train them and teach them that things are wrong. Anyway, let's get into the scriptures, talk about destruction. Turn to, go ahead and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 because, again, people would look at this idea of destruction and think, that well, it says they're destroyed, so therefore, hell, they're just destroyed, and that's the end of it. And as I was looking at these two verses, I'm just going, you know what? Is that correct? But then I remembered a verse in the scripture, 2 Thessalonians 1. And by the way, just because you don't, if you think of a scripture, just because you don't know exactly right then and there exactly what verse it is, this is why we have the software. The fellow that came visited today, he was, man, he was just excited. He was in my office telling me about things that God has shown him. And he said, and he said, I, he said it may sound strange. He said, but I'll be sitting thinking and all of a sudden God will hit me with something. He said, I'll go running to the computer, literally running to the computer. And he said, that pure Bible search software, he said, that is amazing. And he said, I type something in, and I read some verses, and all of a sudden God hits me with something, and he said, I get it, and do a little Holy Ghost dance. I said, I've done that. Used to scare my wife to death till she figured out what was going on. But I said, that's the way you do it. The Holy Ghost is always going to draw you to Scripture. So use the software. If you don't know where to find things, use the software. So hell is naked before him, destruction has no covering. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And look at this. In flaming fire. That Bible's right. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And right here, you have an answer to the question, what about people who have never known God? Read that verse again. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. Okay? Romans 1 tells us that at some point, everybody knew God, and then they chose to be ignorant of God. They made a choice. They decided to take the glory of God and apply it to the glory of man or four-footed beast or creeping things or whatever. But anyway, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Take a look at that. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So number one, it's telling you that God's vengeance is flaming fire. Number two, He's telling you that it's punishment for them rejecting the gospel, the good news. It's punishment. And number three, that it is destruction, but it's an everlasting destruction. Your body will burn. It, it's got enough, we've got enough fat in us all to burn heavy, okay? After a while, your body will burn up, and anything that's burnable will be burnt, and there's no more burning. But it's not your body that's going to hell. It's your soul. And your soul is eternal. One way or the other, your soul is eternal. Just as the souls of those who are in heaven... They are going to live in the presence of God for all of eternity. Those who obey not the gospel of God, their souls are turned into hell, the flaming fire of God's vengeance punishing them 
destroying them with everlasting destruction. How long does it take then for the soul to burn? Forever. It takes an eternity for the soul to burn. And it will always burn. It will do that forever and forever and forever. Because the punishment of sin is eternal. It's everlasting. It's, it's a sentence of death upon us. And that death is everlasting death. Now, back to this issue of being, I, I kid you not. Churches marketing themselves. I, had, I knew this in the back of my mind too. I thought, man, I've seen somewhere where a church promoting itself as being naked. Okay, now, I just want to encourage you, don't do a Google image search of this. Because believe it or not, there are nudist churches. Okay, and make sure your filter on Google is set to safe. Okay, mine is. So you get little glimpses of it. You don't get the whole deal. But there are churches who go to, people who go to church and strip off naked and think that they're worshiping God. Somebody told me this last week, I can't remember who it was, one of these goofball TV preachers actually said, and I, boy, I should, get, I should get it right, and I can't remember who it was, but they said one of these guys actually said that nudity is a form of worship between you and God. That's wicked. That is an abomination because, well, let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Nakedness is not a blessing. It's a curse. It shows forth the shame of our sin and our transgression. Adam and Eve, let's read it. Genesis 3 verse 7. The eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Now, ask yourself the question, did Satan give them the whole story in telling them about eating that fruit? He, he told them their eyes would be open, but he never told them what they would experience after that happened. Once their eyes were open, they recognized that they were naked in the presence of God, and immediately they were ashamed. Immediately. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. That's how you get all those paintings of Adam and Eve. The paintings of Adam and Eve always have them behind a tree, very conspicuously, behind a tree, right? You never see the whole deal, just behind a tree. That's, that's what they were doing. They were hiding in verse 9, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. But there was an immediate recognition of their shame and of their nakedness before God, and immediately they hid themselves. Now, I want to tell you that in my opinion, this is just me, a, a people who more and more and more are comfortable being unclothed before other people, that shows the depravity in their mind and in their heart. There was a time when women and men did not leave their house in America as undressed as men and women leave their house now. It was, it was, not, it was not acceptable as far as the morals and standards of the day. It was not acceptable to be in town. It was not acceptable to be even at the beach the way people are now. It was not acceptable. As we become more and more depraved and farther removed from the Word of God, man's nature begins to defile its own self and he unclothes himself and thinks that there's nothing wrong with that. Now, he may have the bare minimum covered and think that it's okay. But it's not. 
There are even places in the Bible that show you that showing the thigh is a form of nakedness. God established that two places in the Bible. And again, I'm not the one who says to you, well, that's immodest or that's modest or whatever. If you're right with God, you walk out of the house a certain way and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost starts pulling on you saying, that doesn't look right, that don't look right, that don't look right. Then I ought to tell you, that don't look right. Let the Holy Ghost be your guide. And the closer you get with the Word of God and the Holy Ghost, God will show you what's right and what's not right. God will show you what's acceptable and what's not acceptable as far as modesty, as far as the difference between masculine and feminine dress. I'm one of the, I think a man ought to look like a man and a woman ought to look like a woman. Okay? And I'll let, I'll let God tell you how that works in your life but I just know when a man's wearing certain kind of clothes, I'm just going, that looks like a sissy to me. I mean, I wouldn't wear it. Or you see a certain woman around and you're going, that just looks way too butch for that woman. Amen? I'm just telling you, God will let you know. God let Adam and Eve know, you're naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of that tree? And it was an immediate, that it was the presence of sin. That caused them to be naked. Now take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. God's going to give you the opposite here. As heaven is a blessing of clothing, hell is the everlasting curse of nakedness. Those who go to hell strip down and they are naked for eternity. That showing the symbol of their shame and their reproach. Now, think about this. What did they do to Jesus when they put him on the cross? They stripped his garment off of him. Now, I know we don't see, have paintings, and it's not, we don't have this picture in our mind of Christ being totally naked on the cross, but I think he was. And I think the symbolism of that was he was bearing our shame. Taking on our shame. On the cross, him being naked. That's, that is, that's, that's a good God, Brandon. 2 Corinthians 5, 2. For this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Ladies, you ever worry about what to wear? God's got something for you. And guys, God's got a clothing for us that he has picked out himself. And he's going to clothe us in his own righteousness. White, linen, fine, and clean. The righteousness of the saints, the Bible says. So he said in verse 3, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Think about it. Think about the end of a garment going over you. It is immortality swallowing up mortality. The mouth of the opened end of the garment coming over us and swallowing up our nakedness and our mortality. Immortality covering us himself. Now he that wrought, or he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. So think about that. If, you, if God has saved you and he's washed you clean, he's covered you with his righteousness. He has also given you his Spirit and the earnest of his Spirit and just like Adam and Eve, we don't want to be ashamed and naked. Just like a child grows up to a certain age and they come to the realization, I don't want to go out of the bathroom or out of my bedroom with no clothes on. I want to be covered. When a born-again, Bible-believing Christian is truly right with God, they'll want to be covered. It's in our nature. We have been given a new nature 
of God himself. And there's nothing in us that wants to be unclothed or naked, even as far as the flesh is concerned. I, I just, I'm one of these, I think when God saves you, he changes your nature. The evidence of God's salvation in a person's life is a, is a changed lifestyle, a changed nature. So, as the image of those who are lost, who go about wanting to be unclothed, in front of people, so also those who are right with God, they want to be covered in front of other people. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? And that just, man, that just hit me. The, the, uh, the exact opposite. Hell and, and destruction are naked before God. They're uncovered. Just the opposite. We who are appointed for heaven, we're not wanting to be in heaven so we can be unclothed. We want to be with Christ, clothed upon with his righteousness. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. The Laodicean church. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. Revelation chapter 3 verse... Uh, let's go back to um, 14. Unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art uh, neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, which is the fusion of the two, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Knowest not that thou art there's five things here, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Naked is the fifth thing here. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Go back to this gold tried in the fire. You know what I think of? Now, there's probably another verse that connects this better. But Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. The gold and the silver that we need is this Bible. The riches of the Word of God. You'll, listen, you'll never tap God out of His riches and His wealth in this book. You'll never, you'll never get it all. Amen? But then he says, and, that, and, and, and uh, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes that thou mayest see. And you skip to Revelation 16. Verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his what? His garments. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Nakedness. I, I, I saw this in my study and I didn't, I didn't pull the verse in. But I'll never forget the first time I'm studying Saul. And I'm following his life. And I see that when David anointed him to be king, he was prophesying with the prophets. And they said, you know, Saul, the, is, he, is, he among the, is Saul among the prophets? That's how he started. And as he went downhill, there's a passage, you look it up. There's a passage where Saul ends up buck naked and prophesying in the nude. And I saw that, and I immediately thought, Saul ain't right with God. Nobody who's right with God prophesies in the nude. Even Peter, after Christ's death and resurrection, Peter says, I go a-fishing. And you remember how Jesus found him? In his boat, naked. And when Jesus found him, he put his clothes back on. There's nothing in this Bible that signifies that nudity or nakedness is anything but the absence of God and the absence of shame. Okay? How do sodomites, if you, I don't ever do this, but I've seen clips of these sodomite gay pride parades. They are not ashamed of anything 
not ashamed of anything. And how they are allowed to put on this public display of their wickedness without getting in any kind of trouble is just beyond me. I have no idea how they get away with this, other than they probably know the phone numbers of city officials. You get what I'm saying? Okay, I'm just saying, you start looking at Saul's life, and all of a sudden he's prophesying naked. He's on his way downhill. Things are not right between him and God. All right? Now, let's go to the book of Jonah. This is another similitude of hell. How is hell described? Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. If you look in um, verse 14, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon his innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done it as... As it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. The sea, always going to be like a, a picture of hell, the lake of fire. What kind of water is seawater? And salt on a wound does what? Salt in the Bible is a picture of burning. Okay? That's, that's, I think that's the similitude of the sea. Being salty is that when it hits a wound on your body, you know it. It burns like crazy, okay? And there's other places in the Bible where it talks about a salt and a burning, all right? But anyway, so he cast him into the sea. Verse um, 16, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. I like that phrase, swallow up. Death is swallowed up in victory. Swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, if you say, well, this is a myth, this is a legend, this didn't really happen, but it has great meaning to it. If it's a lie, I don't care what it means. Amen? So, in chapter 2, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me, out of the belly of hell. Cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. So when we look in, if we go to Matthew chapter 12, we see the connection here that Christ teaches us, that Christ himself makes. He's going to show us then, what did Jonah mean when he said, I was in the belly of hell, and he's in the whale's belly. What did he mean? Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Think about all these churches that are all signs and wonders churches. Everything's got to be signs and wonders, signs and wonders. And, and to them, if there's no signs and wonders then that's, that, that must mean God's not here. We've got to have a sign. We've got to have a wonder. That's a setup for a false prophet who's going to do lying signs and wonders. He's going to deceive these people because he's able to do signs and show forth wonders. And God warned us about that. He warned us about that in Deuteronomy. Uh, what was it? Deuteronomy 13. If a man give you a, if a, man to give you a sign or a wonder and it come to pass... He's going to lead you into serving other gods. And God said, I sent that man to test you whether you're going to serve me or not. So he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he's talking about the lower parts of the earth, literally, the very, I think, the very center of the earth. And what we know is the farther down you go into the earth, the hotter it gets. That's what we know for a fact. Those miners from Chile that were trapped in that mine, they were working, you know, if we go down here to Bonterre Mines, it's nice and what, about 58 degrees in there year-round? It's nice to go in there, amen? These guys were way lower than that. 
trapped down there for like 69, almost 70 days. And it was about 95 degrees every day down there. And they had to deal with that heat. And the farther down you go, the hotter it gets. That's the fact. That's the truth. Okay? And so think about it. That's where hell is. It's in the lowest part of the earth. Um, take your Bible, turn to 1 Peter. Peter explains this a little bit uh, in 1 Peter 3 and then uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. But in the lower parts of the earth, the Bible refers to it as a prison. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Who did? Jesus did. He went during his three days. This is what we're, this is what we're gleaning from Scripture. Three days, three nights, he spends in the heart of the earth. What is he doing there? He's preaching. He's preaching to spirits that are in prison. Two groups of them. One group is in Abraham's bosom. And they are comforted. That's what a bosom represents. represents comfort. They are comforted in Abraham's bosom. They are those who believed and received righteousness by their faith even before Christ came. To me, that, that's interesting, and it blesses me to know that even before Christ died, those who died in faith before Christ, they still didn't have to suffer anything until Christ came. God did not throw them into a fiery pit and let them suffer there because Christ hasn't made the atonement yet. The Bible says that Christ had been slain from the foundation of the world. To me, that means that his sacrifice applied both past, present, and future. So, here they are in Abraham's bosom. Christ preaches the gospel to them. Tells them, let me tell you who I am. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jesus. I am the Son of Man, but I'm also the Son of God. I'm here to set you free. Okay? And he set captivity free, the Bible says. And then he turns. Let me introduce myself. I am Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, your judge. You're here, and you're in agony, and you're going to remain here for two days, 2,000 years. And when I return, I'm going to resurrect every one of you guys, and you're going to go stand before God in judgment. And you're going to be judged, and you're going to be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and forever and forever. See, we have a similar system. Those who are arrested and have bail taken away from them or whatever, they're in jail until judgment. And then when they're judged, they're sent to... Bill Cosby's fixing to go to prison. Do you hear that? He's found guilty. Pervert. Okay? He's perverted. They found him guilty. And he's fixing, he's, I've read something today, he's pre preparing himself mentally. He's going to spend the rest of his life probably in prison, probably die there. Okay? So that's, that's how it works. Jail, judgment, and then prison. So verse 20, back here in 1 Peter 3, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure, wherein to even baptism, doth also now save us, Water baptism saves us. That's not what it says. It says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. The baptism is the baptism of the soul and the baptism of a conscience. God, you know you sinned. You know you did it. But you have been forgiven, and now God has given you the conscience of a saved person that says, I know what I've done, but I also know that I'm forgiven by God's grace. And only the Holy Ghost, only the Word of God can clean your conscience like that. Amen? Amen. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Boy, here's our example right here. That's where he's going to bring Sodom and Gomorrah into the deal. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 
Even angels have sinned. In fact, the Bible specifically says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But then hell hath enlarged herself, the Bible says. Had to make more room for sinful man. But it's, apparently its original purpose was for the devil and his angels, for them also to burn for eternity. So, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, For God spared not the angels that sinned, angels being made higher than us. If God's not going to spare them, He's not going to spare everybody else either. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, deliver them into chains of darkness. Think about that. The Bible's describing it. Number one, it's on fire. Number two, you are naked. You have been disrobed now. You have to bear your shame. Then we find out that those who are in prison are chained. That's like the old style of prison. Where they chained people to a wall. And that was, that's where they left them. Okay? They had to sit there in their own filth. This is how God describes it here. This is, again, the similitude of hell is describing it. Delivering them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Now he's bringing Noah back up again. Think of how God destroyed the earth. He covered it with water. Okay? In the end times, what's he going to cover the earth with? Fire. Okay? And turning the city. Now watch this now. Uh, let's go back to Noah. Noah, the eighth person, preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse 6. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. You see, if you believe the Bible, you don't have a problem believing that God took four cities and utterly destroyed them so completely that they can't be found. I mean, archaeologists love to dig up old cities. They find in cities all the... Uh, for a while, people didn't believe the Bible because they thought Jericho was a myth. They finally dug up Jericho. They said, oh, it's real. It's, the Bible was right when it talked about Jericho. And we see the walls have fallen down. They were proving the Bible. They can't find Sodom and Gomorrah. Turn them to ashes completely. And if you believe the Bible, you get it. And deliver just Lot. Now think about Lot. Think about Lot's life. Okay, he wasn't the best of men, and yet God justified him. Because the two angels, think of two witnesses, think of Old Testament, New Testament. The two angels went to Lot and told Lot what was going to happen. Did Lot believe them? Yes. And he was saved. Did Lot's wife, she turned back. Okay. Um... Delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth, <clears throat> listen to this, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now think about that. Everybody that's in hell right now, that's not where they're going to end up. Apparently, where they're going to end up is worse than where they are now. And we see, we, we saw when we started this, we saw the rich man being in hell, being in torments. He's going to be, he's being held there to be judged and at the judgment of God, he is going to be cast into the lake of fire, then to be punished. But hell right now is just that holding place, and it's bad enough. Uh, my brother-in-law used to tell me about a guy that he used to run with. He told me his name, and he said... He's run more than once from the cops, and he's told me that he's never going to let the cops catch him, ever. 
And lo and behold, he ends up being chased by Jefferson County police all over Jefferson County. Ends up drowning, I think, in the Merrimack River. And Steve told me that's how he wanted to go. Because he said, I'm never going back to jail. Never going back. And I went, was that the guy? And he said, yeah, that was the guy I was talking about. He said, he said he wasn't going back to jail. But he ended up in a place far worse than Jefferson County Jail. And he's going to end up in a place far worse than where he is now. I'd rather spend my life in jail and see eternity in heaven than to be free on this earth and spend eternity in hell. Amen. Amen. Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom, I'm going to finish dealing, we're going to look at Sodom. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to what? Fornication. It says fornication first, then strange flesh. Okay, I was going to go, what translation are you reading from? But no, it says strange flesh, but it says fornication. Now stop and think about that. We all like to say, well, sodomites, they're going to get what's coming to them. But fornication is what's mentioned here. And you say, what is that? It is any kind of adult activity outside of the marital role. Any kind. Period. Okay? Giving themselves over to fornication. There are people, I promise you, who will refuse salvation simply because it'll mean they have to give up fornication. Think of how deeply fornication is embedded now into our country. Most adults, most teenagers, now moving down into children, fornication is so deeply embedded in our own people. And I don't know, maybe it didn't used to be that way or maybe it was just covered up, but now it's open. Now it's, people don't care anymore. People can do whatever they want to and justify it. They live in ungodly ways and refuse church because that'll mean giving up their fornication and they don't want to do it. So, that's, this is a nation giving herself over to fornication. And going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of how long? Eternal fire. The flames never go out. Let's turn to Genesis 19, and then we'll, we'll end it here tonight. Here's what God did. Genesis 19, verse 23. Do you believe the Bible? Say amen. amen. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Where did that brimstone come from? It came from heaven. Now, I mean, I've heard some say, well, you know, there was a, a sulfur pit, you know, miles away, and it exploded, and then we see the evidence. I, I'm just, it looks to me like it didn't come from the earth. It came down from heaven. And he uber, uber through. That's the old King James. <laughs> he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. If you remember, Lot chose Sodom for what reason? Well-watered plains. And where we think Sodom was, there by the Red Sea, or the Dead Sea, they ain't nothing grows. Nothing. Okay? That which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind, and she became a pillar of salt. Remember what salt is. 
It's, it's a picture of burning. A pillar of salt. Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Look there. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as what? The smoke of a furnace. You think about that. In Revelation 9, when the star falls from heaven, he's been given the key of the bottomless pit. When he opens that pit, what, do, what happens? Smoke as of a smoke of a great furnace. What Abraham was seeing was a, a picture of what hell is like. The smoke of a great furnace. God set forth Sodom and Gomorrah as an example to every one of us. This is what I do to the ungodly. This is what I do to those who have given themselves over to fornication. So you have to always ask the question, and I mean always. Is my lust worth Going to hell over. What you lust after, what you covet for, what you desire, is it worth going to hell over? Because, I mean, poor Bill Cosby, he's fixing to go to jail the rest of his life for being a fornicator. But excuse me, Hollywood is full of fornicators. And most of them are getting away with it. For now. Maybe, maybe somebody will approach Bill Cosby while he's in prison with the gospel. Because there's, I mean, we get letters from guys in prison all the time saying thank you for, I, I guess somebody's giving them our DVDs, I don't know. But there's ministries in prison. Maybe somebody will reach that man before he dies. Because God's already taken his eyes away. He can't see anymore. Okay? But there's people now who have given themselves over to fornication and strange flesh, and it's getting worse, and they think they're getting away with it, and they're not going to. And neither is any of us. It's not worth going to hell over. Okay? And even the Bible says that they burned in their lust, one for another. Well, that metaphor there, that gets you, doesn't it? The burning lust brings the burning judgment, the burning wrath. 